Welcome back to the Red Dice Stories RPG podcast. I'm John, joined as ever by my co-host and wife, Hannah. Hi. And we're going to be looking at monsters in RPGs. And not just monsters in general, a specific monster. But we thought to make this a little bit more fun for us, we're going to pick a monster at random. So Hannah, how do you think we can randomly pick a monster then? So I've got a D30 in one hand. and Classic D30. The classic second ed monster manual in the other. That's the AD&D second ed monster manual. I've rolled a 23, so... That will be a W. Okay. And the first thing on W is Living Wall. All right, that's a random one. <laughs> okay, so let's turn to page 224 and see what the uh, AD&D second edition monster manual says about the Living Wall. Well, it's got a double page all to itself. Okay, so the AD&D second edition monster manual says... Living walls appear to be normal walls of stone or brick, although they radiate both evil and magic if detected. Improvision doesn't detect any peculiar patterns. However, characters who cast a true seeing or appear through a gem of seeing will see past the illusion. The wall consists of graying and sinewy flesh, of faces, hands, broken bones, feet and toes jutting from the surface. Characters within five yards can hear low moans of horror. The living wall contains the melded bodies of humanoids and monsters who died within 100 yards since its creation. Those who fight a living wall are absorbed into it and actually strengthen it. And there's a a little gruesome picture here of a wall with skeletal hands and skulls embedded in it. Very um, Cronenberg from the sounds of things. Yeah. Just your sort of monster. And it seems that it's, uh, from the look of it, it's designed to sort of bridge that gap between being an actual monster and a trap Mm -hmm. because although it's a monster it's not a monster in this typical sense of it just runs up to you and it starts attacking you it's just a wall that's there but when you try and climb over it or you try and overcome it like you would do with a normal wall you can get absorbed into it or if creatures die within a distance of it their their sort of bodies get pulled into the wall And it says here in the ecology section that chaotic evil mages occasionally create these. The exact method is unknown, but several years of preparation are required. Apparently they also arise spontaneously in Ravenloft. So if you're taking a bit of a journey into the mist, you might want to be on the lookout for the old bricks and mortar. So, do they exist in the current version of D&D? Are they a main... I don't recall. Well, see, I don't recall seeing them in the main monster manual, fifth edition. They appear to be. They're certainly not called living walls anymore. If they are, no, I'm pretty sure they're not in there. Let me just have a a quick look on the old uh, internet. See what we can find about that. They may have been produced uh, as a sort of fan supplement or something like that. If you have a look on the D and D wiki at dndwiki.com, there is an entry for Living Wall as a fifth edition creature, and it's pretty much the the same sort of description here. It describes it as a horrifying construct, like undead, made of the bodies of humanoids compressed into the shape of a wall, often encountered in the lairs of necromancers, liches, or vampires, serving as part of a torture chamber, or to cover the true openings of secret passages. No one knows whether they're limited in size or longevity. And I'm having a quick look at the old dictionary of mythology to see if there's anything that might fit the bill in here. So, I think these, certainly from my experience, these seem to be mainly be a sort of a D&D centric creature. I... Although I, I believe I've seen them used in D&D before, I've not come across them in any other particular systems. And obviously they're not really a mainstream monster, they're a little bit on the niche side, but they're obviously popular enough, like I say, perhaps because they're bridging this gap between sort of trap slash terrain feature and monster, that they've been adapted to 5th edition. So interestingly, the Dictionary of Mythology says that there is a demon who's a duke in hell called Wall. 
That might be an interesting take to put on the creature. And looking on the internet, I can see that in demonology, Vual, also pronounced Wall, is a mighty Duke of Hell, commanding 37 legions of demons. He gives the love of women, causes friendship between friends and foes, and tells things past, present, and to come. Often depicted as a dromedary, so a a one-humped camel that after a while changes shape into a man and speaks the Egyptian language, but not perfectly with a deep voice. So, looking at the sort of the mythological stuff, it seems to be like more closely tied into demonology and mm. demons, whereas the traditional D&D versions are seen more necromantic. Yeah, just, it's a constructed thing. Just a interesting frame to put on it if you wanted to. Um, obviously there's not really much else in there that I can see about living walls or walls of flesh. But, no, but if, if we think about it, it has sort of been represented in like popular media. I mean, think about, um, there's the bit in Labyrinth with like, the, hand, oh, yeah, the helping the, hands that come out of the wall. There's loads of stuff in films with like walls of flesh, um, particularly Hellraiser. Yeah. That's got loads of that sort of image. And I mean, if, if, even if you go back to the old um, UK TV classic Nightmare, they had the faces that appeared in the walls as like guardians that asked you like the questions three before you could like continue on oh, your journey. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think potentially we've got a, a couple of assets or facets we can look at them. One, they're obviously an obstacle because a wall in mm-hmm. RPGs tends to be it's blocking you off from getting somewhere you have to get round it or through it to get to your objective yeah it it's a good way for a high level villain to guard his place that he's hiding in when your players are out hunting for him that's like it you mentioned a vampire's lair or a necromancer's tower could be surrounded by one of these walls that's it and i think the the advantage of having this sort of thing is it adds an extra element to that. So it's not just, oh, it's a giant wall, we've got to climb over it, or we've got to like, smash our way through it. Because if you try those, obviously this thing's going to try and absorb you. But it's also partly a trap, because obviously traps in D&D, they tend to be, you don't immediately see them, the rogue or whatever has to search them out. And per the description in both the AD&D Monster Manual and the D&D Wiki, these things have an almost like an illusion that makes them look like a normal wall. Yeah. So you're not instantly going to see them and think, oh, necromantic bad guy I've got to like mm-hmm. take on in combat. So it, it's, it's a bit of a trap, it's a bit of a monster. Although I do remember a certain Zimacy from about 20 years ago who built himself a cathedral of flesh purely for intimidation purposes to yeah. meet other characters in that game and show them how scary you were as you sat on your throne made of many of your child uh. <laughs> yeah and um the, the character hannah's referring to there was uh, a character i played in um, a mind's eye theater sort of vampire game ages ago and as hannah says the the purpose of using the sort of flesh twisting arts of that vampiric clan to to make this horrendous cathedral was pretty much entirely for intimidation purposes and to make people think that my character was more of a badass than he actually was and basically to to avoid unpleasantness by going like look this is what's going to happen with you if you start so let's just like not have a combat let's just have a conversation and i think potentially you could use the living wall in the same way i mean let's face it if you go towards a like a vampire's lair And when you're facing him in this room, maybe he's got some of these walls that don't have this illusion on Mm -hmm. and you can see straight away what they are. You're going to know that he's got some sort of magical power backing him up and he's obviously like... Yeah, that that is one scary dude when he's sitting there on his living throne with all the walls around him chomping for your blood. That's it. And also because these walls get bigger and they absorb like the bodies of the enemies of this person you can sort of see what's happened to the people who've like crossed that villain in the past so without having to like bump up your challenge rating of your monster or anything like that you've sort of set the stage and immediately you you know a lot about this bad guy when you confront them in a lair that has this sort of thing in it well yeah that's another element anyone that's going to create it or make use of it is going to be properly depraved 
and you might find you've got a couple of players that might be a bit too squeamish about that if you make it too gruesome. Yeah, so I mean, make sure you do pitch this to your player group. You could potentially put a group of 10 year olds up against this as a D&D monster and play down the like gruesome elements, but say, oh, it's got a few arms sticking out of it with a sword in or whatever. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a lot of it's how you describe it, isn't it? I mean, if you've got, but, play, if you've yeah. got players who are into it, you can describe like the sort of <laughs> moaning souls trapped in the wall and these like bony hands reaching out and stuff like that. But if you've got players who are maybe a little bit more on the squeamy side you can still use monsters like this but you can just play down those horrific elements a little bit if you need to you know what the the sort of the pitch of your game is so judge it accordingly so can you think of any other potential uses you could use aside from intimidation factor you could use this living wall for well obviously as you say it is a fairly brutal trap um sort of vaguely shining-esque almost that idea oh, of like yeah. walking down the corridor and it seems like a perfectly normal building and then suddenly you realize you're actually walking on flesh and all the walls around you are made of flesh but by then it's too late it's already got you i tell you what it reminds me of as well you know that um you know that scene in poltergeist where she gets like pulled into the tv and that hand sort of reach out of the tv yeah. it's it reminds me of that and Obviously, just because it's called the living wall doesn't mean you couldn't take that idea and use it for other things. It could be the floor of a chamber. It could be like a portrait or a picture that entraps people's oh, souls. Oh, yeah, like um, that scene at the start of The Frighteners, and obviously that's like yeah. a ghost. But it's just like they've used, I think, some sort of very stretchy fabric and somebody leaning against it, but it looks like there's a figure... Like coming pushing out, out, the out wall, of the wall yeah. and then he goes behind a painting and pushes through the painting that's a really good image as well yeah and I mean especially if you're running a, a horror game with these horror themes into it the the scenery can add an awful lot to your descriptions and to the atmosphere of a game like that but having a creature like this which is potentially a monster for argument's sake but is also part of the scenery. It's it's a handy bridge over though that sort of gap. If you choose to highlight it, it can be used for like that proper sort of dark element. If you like, choose to think about all the people that have gone into it, yeah, and the fact that they have no longer got any control over what they're doing. Um, I, I think the thing that makes this this particularly horrifying is. If you're absorbed into the wall, it like traps your soul in it. Now, obviously, we know that like death in D and D tends not to be as final as in real life. There's resurrection, reincarnation, stuff like that. But if your character's soul is pulled into one of these living walls, effectively, you can't be reincarnated or resurrected until somehow they've got your soul out of the wall. And that could be a whole like quest unto itself, really. Exactly. Yeah, your friend, your person, whatever, has got stuck in that wall you're going to want to see it destroyed well that's i mean think of the horror of like let's say you get into the vampire's keep you make it out but you've lost like a couple of friends you go to the temple with like your sack loads of gold and you're like oh i need you to resurrect my friend and they're like well we we, we can't do it their soul's not where it's supposed to be we don't have their body you then have to sort of go back sort of quest back in there to try and recover the body and the soul of your friend not just that, but all the like people that you could put in as NPCs who've just wandered in one after another trying to save the person that went before them. Oh, my little child wandered into the wall. Yeah. And um, then my husband went after him. And Yeah, I, th- I think so they, they could be so really forth. horrifying. <laughs> but as we say, you know, pitch it as appropriate for your yeah. group. This isn't going to be to every group's flavour. But if you've got a group who like don't mind those horror tropes and they don't mind it getting a bit darker and a bit nastier, just, just go for it. Cool monster. Yeah. Pretty like cool. we use the dice. Yeah, I mean, I, I've, I do vaguely remember reading that monster and thinking it was cool when I first got the, the D&D, the AD&D second edition monster manual. But uh, I think I've seen it used in one game, some variant of it. But I've, it, I think, it, again, it's one of those niche monsters that like doesn't really see a lot of use. Mm-hmm. 
which is a shame. So yeah. if you're looking for something horrendous that uh, your bad guy can have to really like bolster up the, the evilness of their reputation, whilst also making their sort of their fortress, their keep, whatever, dangerous unto itself, you could do far worse than looking at the Living Wall. Like I say, it's in the AD&D 2nd Edition Monster Manual. And also, if you do a quick search for Living Wall 5th Edition, you will find a version of it on the D&D Wiki for the latest version of D&D. Thanks for listening. We hope you've enjoyed that episode. If you want to get in touch with us, you can drop us an email. The address is rddrpgpodcast at gmail.com. Or if you want to leave us a voicemail message, you can head over to our page on speakpipe.com and that will allow you to leave a 90 second voicemail and you might even be featured in a future show. There's a link to this included in the show notes as well as a link to our website and other places where you can contact us. We hope you enjoyed the show and we'll see you soon.